Good morning. Good morning. What do you guys think of this fall we're having? Yeah. You know what? God's shown his splendor. It, it amazes me. You know, you look at it, you see all the colors, and you know, you wake up in the morning and it's nice and crisp, and then it gets hot, and not nearly as hot as it was. And uh, it just God's handiwork never ceases to amaze me. Um, I really feel for my family that lives in Houston. <laughs> that they go from green everywhere to green most everywhere except for what died. And then it just goes back to green. And, you know, they, they don't really have seasons like we have seasons. So I'm, I'm very grateful, I'm blessed <laughs> that I get to live in Montana. And I tell God that frequently. Thank you for letting me live here. I can't remember where we were, but earlier this week, um, we heard a song that uh, kind of brought back some memories. And it, it got me to thinking. Um, I'm probably going to date myself here, but the song was uh, I Want to Know What Love Is by Journey. And I was with the kids, and I thought, oh, this was a great dance song when I was in school. Nice and slow, and you could really hold on and dance. And you didn't have to do a wave in your arms and all that silly stuff. You just had to avoid stepping on her toes. And uh, I, I really like the musicality of the song, but the, the words, you know, kind of struck me for the first time. I want to know what love is. And see, we're in Colossians. Chapter 3, I'm just going to read the, the little snippet to you again. We're, we're still working through this description of what a, a, a Christ-led life looks like. Corinthians, uh, Colossians, sorry, uh, chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Uh, and we're, ironically enough, we're at the passage that says, uh, above all these, put on love. And so I, I thinking about this song, I want to know what love is. I just did a, a quick scan, it just, just in my brain. I came up with three different songs that the world sings that, that have to do with love, okay? Journey, I want to know what love is. Can you tell me? Can you show me? What is love? And then there's the Beatles. All you need is love. All you need is love, but I don't know what it is. Can somebody show me what it is? But all we need is love. And then you got Tina Turner. What's love got to do with it? <laughs> and I came to this resounding conclusion. The world has no clue <laughs> what love is. The world doesn't know. Um, you know, when you fall in love, uh, that's a hormonal response. It'll fade. Trust me, give it about 90 days. Or the first bad fight. It's got nothing to do with how you feel. The world bases it on feelings. That's why we've got divorce rates approaching 70%. Oh, we're so in love. We have to get married. Well, I thought you were in love, not anymore. We fell out of love. Fell out of love. The emotional response is ended. And so, looking at this passage, um, above all these things, now, what, above what things? All of these characteristics, all of these attributes, all of these things that should be a natural outgrowth of being plugged into the vine through which life flows. Above all of these, put on love. Take on love. Now he's saying this, put on. I think he uses this, this term particularly. I don't think he's just kind of throwing things together here. I think he's telling us we need to take upon ourselves something that is not natural to us. Hear what I'm saying? He's telling us to do something that doesn't come natural to us, that is not endemic to the human nature. Okay? Put on love. 
What is love? See, the, the title of my message today is, What is love? Because, you know, God speaks quite a bit about love in the, the, the Bible, in the Old and the New Testament. Now, for some of you, you kind of grew up with the same indoctrination that I did, and, and there was the God of Judgment that was the Old Testament, and somewhere in the 400 intertestamental period days, he had a change of heart, and he became the God of love in the New Testament. There was a conversion experience somewhere in there, and he became a new God. He softened. That's not the case. See, I was looking it up, and, and it, it's kind of a little bit hard to determine, because the English language uses so many different words to convey the same idea of love. We talk about affection, we talk about compassion, we talk about mercy, we talk about charity, and, and love, and brotherly love, and, and we have a bunch of different ways that are translated. And the nearest I can figure, there's actually about 530 uses of the term that would indicate love in the Old and the New Testament. And they're just about split even. Okay? So, there's not a God in the Old Testament that is not loving. And a God in the New Testament that is not judging. It's one and the same God. And the judging is every bit as much of a part of Him as the loving. And as a matter of fact, the judging is every bit as much of a part of the loving. Do you understand that? See, we have to come to an understanding of what love is because God is love. One of the, the greatest passages that we have, uh, turn with me if you would, uh, 1 John. Actually, don't turn there yet. I want to share something with you. This has really not a lot to do with it. It's just something that I came across in my research, and it just struck me. Okay? Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm quoting from a paper that was written um, by the, the man's name is Farid Mahali. And it's a study of the word love in the Quran. Okay? This is a, a man who, who actually looked at the concept and he looked into the Quran. And this is, this is what he has to say. Um, what is accepted as commonplace in Christianity is a dim reflection in the Quran. While God is great, Allahu Akbar, is a statement of faith, affirmation, and expression, God is love, Allahu Mutiba is absent from the attributes of God. In the Quran, you do not see Allah mentioned as God is love. Now, he has loving attributes. As a matter of fact, there's 20 times that it mentions him as being loving. 20 in the entire Quran. But you don't see that given to him as an attribute. So turn with me, if you would, 1 John, we're going to turn over to chapter 4. Now, before we start reading, we need to have a firm grasp of what Paul has directed us. Paul being led of God's Spirit, so really... God is directing us. When he says put on love, these are things that we have to practice. These are things we have to aspire to, things we are struggling to attain. Remember, not perfectly, increasingly. Okay? We are working toward these. Don't use that as an excuse to say, oh, today I didn't work very hard. This year I didn't work very hard. These are things that we are called to be working towards. Alright? So 1 John... Chapter 4, I'm going to start in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent His Son, His only Son, into the world, so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, 
God abides in us, and His love is perfected in us. But this is how we know that we abide in Him, and He in us, because He has given us His Spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him, and He in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in Him. I wonder how an English teacher will grade that. <laughs> but this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because He is so also, because He is, ah, let me try this again, because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he cannot, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not. And this commandment we have in him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. I don't know if you're counting, but by my count, there were 27 uses of the word love in that passage. 7 to 21, 14 verses. Why do we love? Why? Well, let's make it easy. Because he told us to. Okay? Can we love apart from God? No. See, when I, when I said, the world has no clue. They don't understand. They don't get it. I'm not speaking just out of my own personal observation. Although I have a lot of observation that would indicate that. I'm speaking from God's Word. If the world does not have God, how can they know love? How can they even comprehend what love is? See, we have a perfect illustration, a perfect example given to us. God loved us so much that He sent His only Son. I don't know why. You know, if God had 13 sons and He sent one, would it have made the value any less? No, because he still died on my part. But he only had one. And that's the one he sent. God sent his only son. That's the example that we have. But he doesn't end there. We don't, because the world can look at that example too. But love doesn't blossom in them. What's different about us and them? We have been sealed with his spirit. His spirit is what makes us uniquely different than them. Not the fact we go to church, not the fact we have 15 Bibles and various translations, not the fact that we frequent conservative or, or uh, Bible websites, not the fact that we have a daily bread that we pick up and read, not the fact that we listen to certain things on the radio. Those all are, are idiosyncrasies. But what makes us different is God's Spirit is living in us. The Spirit of the living God is in us. And when He comes in us, He brings a whole range of things that they don't have. Go back to Galatians. Look at Galatians chapter 5. What is the fruit of God's Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And that's not an exclusive, an inclusive, all-inclusive list. That's just kind of random samplings of the list. These are things that God's Spirit births in us when He comes in. All right. Remember the fruit buds, flowers, and then the fruit, and then the fruit grows heavy. And and some of us are just budding in areas, and others are flowering, and others have really nice fruit. Some of us are just waiting for the fruit to appear. Some of us are posing fruit. We got wax fruit. We, we bring it out and trot it out when it's appropriate to trot it out and, and we put it back all dusty and nasty when it, we can go back to doing what we want to do. Because we're in the New Testament, I'm not even going to go into the Hebrew, but in the New Testament, there, there are, well actually in Greek there are four words that talk about love, that, that we translate as love, okay? Um, we're, the New Testament only uses three. Uh, the first one, eros, which is erotic. It's the um, 
kind of the, the love of the eyes, where you look at something and you're attracted to it. Now, uh, God designed that. Satan perverted that. Okay? God can reclaim that. If God did not put that in you, do you think you'd ever hook up with your wife or your husband? You know, who wants to be with someone that they're not attracted to? God intended that. He designed it. He put it into play. It's been corrupt and, and made bad by the devil. Uh, you look at our society around us, and that's all they want from love. The attractive, the beautiful, the, the titillating moment thing. Okay? But there's there's arrows. But that word's not in the Bible. We we don't find that word any word anywhere in the Bible. Okay. The second word is storge. Okay. Um, this one is used the least frequently in the New Testament. Okay. Uh, storge. I'm, I'm actually going to read um, the translation that I got. I, I looked at a bunch of different translations, and I, I really like the way this one read it. Um, this is the, uh, the love and affection that naturally occurs between parents and children can exist between siblings and exists between husbands and wives in a good marriage. Isn't that cool? This is, this is, that's story. Okay. Now the Greek, they have, they have four different words so you know exactly what they're intending. So when they say, I love SpaghettiOs <laughs> and I love my wife you don't have to guess how that rates. Because some people, I have to guess how that rates. Okay, because I think maybe they love SpaghettiOs a little more than white. Because they pursue it passionately. <laughs> or whatever other thing it is. Because we all have things that, that can... can uh, Keep our attention away from where it should be. So, storge, okay? We see this word in uh, Romans 12.10. It says, uh, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. That's the word storge, brotherly affection. Okay. Um, now, what's funny about that word, this word actually combines two of the Greek words. Okay. Brotherly affection. It's actually saying, um, love one another with love, love. Because it uses storge, and the next one we're going to talk about, phileo. It, it sticks to words together, phileo storgus. Okay. So what it says is, love one another with some kind of love that you love your brother with. And phileo, I'm going to read it, another description, just so we, we kind of can separate the two. This is, this is to have a special interest in Someone or something, frequently the focus of close associations. To have affection for, to like, to consider someone a friend. That's kind of how you like SpaghettiOs. Okay? Not your wife. Although, <clears throat> this word we see used in a couple different places that is significant. This is kind of cool. You remember when Jesus was talking with Peter after the resurrection? Three times he asked Peter, do you love me? Okay, now in the English, we don't really get this. Okay, because we see Jesus saying, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, yeah, of course I love you. He's my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Oh, God. Jesus, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. But what we don't see is the interplay that's going on in the Greek. Because see, when Jesus says, do you love me? He says, do you agape me? And we're going to talk about agape in a moment. And Peter responds, Lord, I phileo you. And Jesus says, Peter, do you agape me? And Lord, you know, I phileo you. And the third time, Jesus says, Hey, Peter, do you phileo me? And Peter, being saddened, because Jesus has reduced the value of love to another tier, he brought it down, and Peter, being sad, says, Yes, Lord, I phileo you. So, this, this kind of special interest and affection for 
a liking to. Now, interestingly enough, there's another place that this word is, is used. And that's in Titus chapter 2. Flip there with me if you would. Titus chapter 2. So we're going to talk about this in a couple of weeks. But I want to touch on it tonight, today, wherever we are. <laughs> Paul is giving advice godly counsel to Titus. Uh, Titus was a young pastor, kind of the same as uh, Timothy. And he's giving him advice for the organization, the running, the administration, the management of, of the church. And he says, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, he says, But as for you, teach what of course is sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women... Likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so, train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, hardworking, uh, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Now, I want to focus here on verse 4. Older women are to teach younger women to love their husbands and children. Interestingly enough, the word used here is phileo, not agape. Wives, you're supposed to be friendly. You're supposed to be friends with your husband and children. I think that's such a unique and interesting twist. You know, in our, our love and respect class, we teach <coughs> that God has by design placed in women an unconditional love for their families. That's, that's why moms get up in the middle of the night to go to the kid that's being sick. That's why, you know, they get up a little bit early to make sure that the ironing is done. They go through all the hassle to make food that the kids go, Ew, yeah, <laughs> you know, and they keep doing it and they keep doing it. That's, that's the nature of what God has placed in moms. But Paul needs, says that they need to be reminded you also have to be friendly. You have to be their friend. Okay? So we're going to go to the fourth type of love. And this is the love that is only ever used to refer to the kind of love that God has for people. Okay? And this is agape. It says agape is the very nature of God. Now, when we were in 1 John, chapter 4, every time he referenced the word love, it was agape, 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 agape. There are no preset conditions on love when it's agape. <coughs> you love them because you love them because you love them because you love them. That's it. Okay? So, when he goes through and he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back up, I want to read this again with this understanding, okay? Just listen to this, you don't have to turn there. It says, Beloved, let us agape one another. Let us love one another in such a way that there are no preset conditions so that I don't love you just because of what you have done for me or what you can do for me. I love you because I love you. And whoever... Or for agape is from God. And whoever agapes has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not agape does not know God because God is agape. In this, the agape of God was made manifest among us and so on and so forth. See, the unconditional love that we are required to have only comes from Him. Now, I'm going to go back and I'm going to change my original statement a little bit. Because, see, I said that the world doesn't know love, and, and that's really not true. What I should have said is the world does not know agape. Okay? But because we only have one word for love, Love means a whole wide spectrum 
of things. And we can't really, in the English language, we don't classify it. That's why I love my dog and I love my kid. And it's the same word. But if I had to choose between the two of them, don't put me to the test. <laughs> because we would have to get rid of our dogs. You know? We, we throw this word about, we bandy it about, and we strip away from it all its meaning and all of its power. Think about this for a moment. I don't know if they still do it today, but every Valentine's Day, you had to sit down in elementary school and write out Valentine's cards to all the kids in your class. Really? Hey, Ralph. <laughs> you know, Ralph that gave me a black eye last week. <laughs> hey, man, be my Valentine. I love you, heart, 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 heart. <laughs> really? <clears throat> we confuse passion with love. Okay? Um... I love football. Well, I I like it. I like to watch sometimes. Um, but I oh, I love hockey. Well, no, I really don't. Um, especially when you compare it to other things, and, and really it's a matter of priority where we put our emphasis. But we we bandied the word about so much as we stripped it of its its power, of its meaning, of anything of redeeming value. And and then we expect it to mean someone, something to someone when we say, I love you. No, I love you. Yeah, you love beef jerky. <laughs> so, moving on. We have the four types of love. Eros, which is not in the Bible, but it's the, the attraction of the eye. Okay? Storge, the close family love that you should have. Now, some of you may not have close family love because of things that happened in your family. Okay? But that's the love that should be there. Phileo. The, the affection. The liking. Philadelphia. Did you guys know that that was just a Greek word? You know Greek? Philadelphia. What is Philadelphia? What is the motto of the city? What is it known for? Brotherly love. Phileo. Delphia. Love, brother. It's the city of brotherly love. There you go, Greek. Cheese sticks. That's right. <laughs> Cheese sticks. Leave it to the guy that cooks to know about the food. <laughs> so, phileo, and then agape. Okay? God is agape. Agapeo. He is love. It's not just affection that can go, you know, when um, they do something you don't like or they root for a team you don't like and so you can't sit in the same room. You know, it's, it's not storge that can be broken by things that happen in life. And it's not eros that can disappear when wrinkles show up. Okay? It's unconditional, unqualified. It's based on the giver, not on the receiver. Okay? So, God is love. Okay? He was love from the beginning. And I say the beginning because it was our beginning, not His. He is without end. He's eternal. He always has been and always will be. So whenever we talk about the beginning, you know, remember in, in Genesis 1 it says, in the beginning, that's referring to us, not Him. Because He's already there. He had to be there to give us a beginning. So in the beginning, God was love. Okay? There was all through the Old Testament, God is love. Think about this for a minute. When Jesus sat with the Pharisee in the middle of the night because the Pharisee was afraid to come to him in the day. And they're talking. He says, uh, what are the two greatest commandments? Well, let's see, you don't have any other gods before me, that'd be important. You probably shouldn't murder. That that's usually important. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, honor your mother and father. That's, that's a good one. And no, what did he say? 
What, what were the two things that he said? Love the Lord your God. Love the Lord your God. With all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. The second is like unto the first. That's a parallel. Okay? They move together. Alright? So you can't you can't say, oh, I love God like this, but I only love my labor, neighbor like that. No, like unto. Like unto. Okay? Well, the way that you love God, the affection and the feelings, the, the, the revelation you have toward God should be the same that you have toward your neighbor. Whether that be the same people in your house, the people next door, the people in your community. Okay? That's the kind of love that we are called to have. Okay? So, this was just a quote from the Old Testament directing us to love. All of the law hinges on these two commands. All the law and the prophets. So everything in the Old Testament hinges on these two things. Love God, love your neighbors. Well, somebody got smart and said, oh, oh yeah, who's my neighbor? Because <laughs> here we're going to open a can of worms. Who do we love? Actually, I'm going to make it easy for you. Who do we not love? Can anybody answer me who we're not supposed to love? Satan. Okay. What else? Idols. What? Not supposed to love idols. Well, idols are Satan because they're demons. Mm -hmm. Let's just take the whole demons thing out of there. We got that. What? Sin. We're not allowed to love money. We're not allowed to love sin. Ourselves. What about people? What people should we not love? Ourselves. No? We do love ourselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. Everybody loves himself. Jesus is not telling us for you first you've got to learn to love yourself so then you can learn to love your neighbor. And we, don't, we get a lot of that crap today. Oh, you've got to love yourself. I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and darn it, people like me. <laughs> Please. Humanism teaches us it's all about us. God teaches us it's not about you. It's about what you do, what you give. Okay? See, there is nobody in this world that we do not love. So, <coughs> let, let's go over to uh, Matthew chapter 5, real quick. Then I'm going to lay something for you. Jesus is teaching the, the Sermon on the Mount. He's laying out a number of things before the people, and actually things that are hard for them. Because he's running contrary to a lot of the teachings that they've been receiving probably their entire life, probably for generations. Okay? And he's laying out stuff that is the truth of God's Word, but it's not the truth of what their culture has taught them. <coughs> So, in verse 43, he says, You have heard it said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemies. See, he's laying down the condition right here. This is what you have been hearing. This is what you have been taught. Okay? Love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Okay, that's hard right there, but look at what he qualifies this with. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Do you see that? Now think about this for a minute. I, I personally, I don't have any enemies that I'm aware of. <coughs> Nobody that I would classify as an enemy. But, but let's, let's look at this kind of in the broader thing. What about Osama bin Laden? I don't think there's a lot of love for him, at least not in America, 9-11. What about Adolf Hitler? You think Jesus was unaware of what was coming when he said love your enemies? You think Jesus didn't know 
that you know, 2,000 years down the road, Adolf Hitler was going to rise up and ravage the Jewish community in Europe? You think he spoke this unthinkingly? That when he said, love your enemies, he was not fully God in that moment, and he was speaking of human ignorance? See, as humans, we're so very easy to classify and quantify and put in these cute little boxes how things should work. But as God, he finds it so easy to shatter those boxes. He doesn't want us stuck in a little box. He wants us to be a light that shines out into the world. Quit putting the bushel over your, your life. He says, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Now, quite honestly, I was offended when the towers went down at 9-11. I was angry. But I was not persecuted. I wasn't in the towers. Quite honestly, you think any of those, those terrorists that were on the planes knew anybody that was in the building? No. It wasn't a personal persecution. It was a political statement. Okay? But he says, pray for those who persecute you. Now he's made it personal. So that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Now, listen to this. Let's follow this thought through. Let's see where Jesus is going. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Now keep in mind, tax collector right here, when Jesus is using this term, that's kind of got the same idea as in America we use for lawyers. You kind of wrinkle your nose, you know, and say, oh, lawyer. Yeah. Tax collector is probably even worse because they, they well, were Jews that accepted the Roman domination and actually sided with the Romans in, in taking money from the Jews and, and pulling away from their own countrymen. So they're, they're traitors. And he says, uh, don't even the tax collectors do the same? Don't even the lowest of the low do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than the others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we don't like to talk about that passage, especially that last verse in the church, because then there's this whole thing, oh, you know, it, it becomes work-based, and we're trying to do it in and of ourselves, and no, that, we're not going there. That's not what it's about. Okay? Where is it that we get our perfection from? Christ. Christ. I mean, if we could get it any other way, there would be no need for the cross. There would be no need for him to come, to die in my place, that his blood would be imputed to me for righteousness' sake. Okay? Now, does that mean that we don't do works? No. It doesn't. And we flip back to Ephesians chapter 2, and it says that we may do the works prepared in advance for us. Right? Are the works under salvation? No, they're because of salvation. They're, they're, they don't grant me eternal life. I do them because I've been granted eternal life. You know, we, we put the cart before the horse. No, it belongs behind, so the horse can see where it's going, and it can drive the way it's supposed to. We do the works because of the salvation. Now, being perfect, to be perfect, you've got to have salvation. You've got to have God's blood, Jesus' blood, poured over your life. That's the only way you're ever going to be perfect. So, but there are things that we can do. And you claim to be perfect and hate your brother. No. Let's go back to 1 John chapter 4. Don't turn there. Because if anyone claims to love God and you hate his brother, then you're a liar. Now you got two sins. Because you cannot claim to love God whom you have not seen and yet hate your brother whom you have. Okay? But let's go beyond that. But actually, a, 
I'll share something with you. Um, when I was a teenager, I have a, a brother that's 15 months older than I am, and we used to fight all the time. Okay, I've told you guys about that before. But at one point, um, when I was getting really serious about my faith in my teenage years, I uh, spent a lot of time studying the Word, and every time I came a passage about how to treat with your brother, I underlined it, and I marked it with TLVN, brother's initials. And so every time I read the scripture, it would remind me, is, is your attitude right? Are you treating him right? Are you doing what you are supposed to be doing? Because I, I could have gone through and I could have underlined it and showed it to him <laughs> while I was ducking. You are supposed to be this is here. But that's not what this is for. Okay? All too often, we want to read this for other people. God didn't write it for other people. He wrote it for you. You is you and you and you and you and you and you and me. So when I'm reading it, the application is to me first. Then when I get all of the splinters and two by fours and planks and everything out of my eye, I'll be in heaven and I'm not going to worry about anything going on here. <laughs> okay? The same thing goes for you. <clears throat> so, who do we love? Everyone. Now, there's one other condition here that I want to share with you. I want to share with you. Um, John 13, don't, don't turn there, I'll just read it for you. John 13, verses 34 and 35. Jesus is speaking, he says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. How did he love them? Uh-huh. No greater love does any man have than this, but that he lay down his life for his friend. Okay? And this is the example that he said. Okay? But, but think about this for a minute. He didn't just lay down his life when he went to the cross. He laid down his life in the entirety of his ministry. Okay? Think about this. He stayed up all night uh, healing and preaching and ministering. It says he was up all night. Okay? And then early in the morning, he got up and he went up on the mountainside to pray. He needed a long time. Me time. You know what me time is? Me time is when you get alone with God. Not when you pamper yourself. There's nothing about pampering yourself in the Bible. I can't find it. So when people go, oh, I need a little me time, I'm assuming that it means you're getting in your prayer closet. Because that's the me time that's laid out for us. He got up by himself. He went up by himself into the wilderness, meaning that there were no people around, and he prayed. All right, he's getting refreshed. The disciples show up. Oh, no, 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 Jesus, what are you doing up here? Now we got people down there. there. There's work to be done. There's entertainment to provide. We got them now. We got them eating out of the palm of our hand. We got to make strike while the iron's hot. We got to get back down there. What does Jesus do? Hey, hey, hey. I'm in my me time. You guys, give me some time. Give me some time. Me time. No, what does he do? No, it is for this reason I come. Let's go down. We're going to go to the other villages. We're going to teach there too. For this reason have I come. I'm going to go. The entire time that Jesus ministered, he was laying down his life. Okay? Greater love has no man than that he lay down his life for his friend. So, he says, a new commandment I'm giving you that you love one another as I have loved you. So, how do we love each other? Well, first we've got to understand how Jesus loved them and how he loves us. No, I'm not expecting that any of you are going to go to a cross for me. I hope you're not expecting that of me. Laying down our lives is the day in and the day out, the daily grind, where we are constantly thinking of others before ourselves. Okay? Remember we talked a couple weeks ago, does God expect us to control our thoughts? Yes. Absolutely. You betcha. Matter of fact, he does it such that it's kind of taken for granted that we will do it. So,
A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. Now, catch this, because again, this isn't the end. He says, by this, by what? By the love we have for one another in the same manner that he loved us. By this, people, all people will know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. Okay? Now, all people. So if you look around, and, and, and I've seen it in churches before, you see the ugly of people come out? You see the ugly in church? Not that we're not going to have disagreements. We can, we, can, we can disagree and still love each other. Absolutely. I mean, you guys don't have to like beef jerky. That's okay. I don't like onions. I'm sorry, I love you, but I'm not going to eat your onions. Okay? Actually, that's not true. If you put it in something, put it before me. I will eat it. But God says you be thankful for the food that you have. So, um, but next time I'm bringing you church. <laughs> so, the world will know that we're His. We're His disciples. We belong to Him by what? The fact that we love each other as He has loved us. Are we visibly apparent to everyone around us as being his disciples. Are you visibly apparent? Is it readily available to anyone that looks that you're Jesus' disciple? Not because you go to church. Not because you have your 15 Bibles. Not because you listen to Christian radio. Not because when you smash your thumb you say darn it instead of the other. But because you love as Jesus loved you. One last thought I want to share with you. Love is a verb. It's an action word. It's not a feeling. It's not a thought something that's put into play. It's something that's worked at and it's done, it's operated on and according to scripture needs to be operated on daily. Minutely. Secondly. We have to be loving. We have to be people of love. What does that look like? Boy, you know, that's a whole other message that we're going to get into it at another time. Now, I didn't even touch on 1 Corinthians 13, and that was actually by choice. Okay? You want to know what love is? Go look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13. This is what love looks like. Actually, what love is, you look at the cross. That's what love is. That's what love is. That the Father loved us so deeply, so much, that he made a way for restored relationships. He's the offended party. He didn't have to do anything. We offended him. So it was incumbent on us to make things right. No way we could. No way we could. So he made a way. He sent his son to the cross on our behalf. That's love. That's love. That's the love we're called to. That's the measure. That's what we are ascribing to. We are striving to attain. That kind of love. Amen. Amen.